and welcome to the Edmonton portion of the team history videos. And the first thing that comes to my attention looking at this board is how much everything has to do with trading. So while we talk about Chiarelli and everything he was doing in, in Edmonton, trading has been a big part of what's going on with the Edmonton Oilers to build them up and tear them down. Um, they're a team that were the Alberta Oilers, Oilers back in the WHA days. Uh, thus, the, the orange color was their color back in the WHA days as well. They come into the NHL, they change over to blue, uh, which most believe was their, their best look. I thought this was this jersey was their best look, and then they went with the really bright orange and darker blue, which I wasn't a huge fan of, and I'm still more partial to this more muted kind of orange. But anyways, uh, it's splitting hairs. Uh, this is a team that's that's had tremendous success. Five Stanley Cups overall, but they haven't had any success really since 1990. Um, they've been in the playoffs 21 out of 40 seasons. So we are we are almost to the point where they've made the playoffs for 50%. So if they if they miss two more playoffs, they're down to 50%, which is not good in a league where the idea of them missing the playoffs in the 80s was uh, pretty far fetched. This was this was a machine. This was a team that could not be stopped, and they kind of stopped themselves. the The situation they find themselves in is of their own doing. Peter Pocklington, in coming into the league, he's told you can't protect Gretzky. Gretzky is not immune. You can't protect him. He can be distributed around the rest of the National Hockey League. Well, that scares Pocklington a lot because he knows what Gretzky is. And the NHL kind of knows what Gretzky... They don't know how big he's going to be. But the the rule is that coming in, the NHL can poach certain players from your roster. And Gretzky was among the, one of the ones that should have been poached. But what Pocklington does, Pocklington puts his name to a 21-year contract. He has no intention of honoring a 21-year contract. But he uses that and he says, Hey, look, I signed Gretzky to a 21-year contract. You guys can't take him away from me. And the NHL goes, fine, you can protect Gretzky. And that's where it starts. If the Oilers had not been allowed to protect Gretzky, if they'd looked at that 21-year contract and said, um, Peter, you don't intend on paying him for 21 years, which would have been accurate and true, then uh, they would have lost him. And who knows where he ends up? Who knows what might have happened? The league could have been completely different. And the Oilers, as we knew it, wouldn't have happened. Gretzky is, of course, the, the biggest star in the league at the height of his game. I would argue he's still the biggest name right up until he retires. So your all-time scoring leaders, Gretzky leads the way. 583 goals, 1,086 assists, 1,669 points. Remember, this is from 1979 to 1988. It's not even a full decade, and he gets 1,669 points. Uh, Yari Curry, 474 goals, 569 assists, 1,043 points. Mark Messier, 392 goals, 642 assists, 1,034 points. Glenn Anderson, 417 goals, 489 assists, 906 points. Paul Coffey rounds out the top five, all Hall of Famers, I might add. Uh, 209 goals, 460 assists, 669 points. Ryan Smith. 296 goals, 335 assists, 631 points. Doug Waite, 157 goals, 420 assists, 577 points. Alish Hemsky. I'm kind of surprised to see Hemsky in the top 10, to be honest. I don't think of him as a guy who, who scored that many points or played that long. But yeah, he's right there. 142 goals, 335 assists, 477 points. Sean Horkoff, 162 goals, 285 assists for 447 points. And... Issa Tikkanen, 178 goals, 258 assists, 436 points. He'll be out of the top 10 pretty quick. Uh, Connor McDavid only has about 50 points to go to start knocking guys out of the top 10. And so I would imagine that he's as high as ninth by the end of this coming season. And the next time around that I do this, and like I said, I want to, you know, every three years probably works. Um, he'll probably be up around where Ryan Smith is right now. Uh, just showing how quickly Connor McDavid's putting up points. Your wins leaders, Grant Fuhrer with 226, Bill Ranford 167, Tommy Sallow 147, Andy Moog with 143, and Cam Talbot 104. 
Uh, a little bit surprising to see Talbot in the top five when you consider how many players have come and gone. And yet, uh, Fuhr and Moog won so many games during the 80s and, of course, ran for the 90s. And Salo had a decent run with them as well. Um, surprise, kind of surprised Dubnik didn't stick around long enough for 100 wins. It feels like he was an oiler for a while, even though that's not the case. Uh, coaching wins, Sather, 464, far and above uh, the best on the bunch of the bunch. Craig McTavish, 301, Ron Lowe, 139, Todd McClellan, 123, and then John Muckler was 75. That seems crazy to me that John Muckler's on there with 75, but say they're hogging all the wins with 464. And there's nothing more iconic from the 80s than this bunch of, of Hall of Famers right here, say they're behind the bench and fear in net. That's as scary as it gets in the mid-80s. And uh, they are, they're, they're a machine. Um, <clears throat> captains, it's not as long a list as it has been on some of the other teams. I'm very grateful for that. And then the next team on the list is Florida, which would be a much shorter list for a lot of things. Uh, Ron Chipperfield is their captain, the inaugural season, 79-80. Blair McDonald, 80-81. Lee Fogelin, 81-83. Gretzky, 83-88. to Then he gets traded. Messier, 88-91. to And then he's out. Kevin Lowe, 91-92. to Craig McTavish, 92 to 94. Shane Corson for 95. Uh, Kelly Buckberger, 95 to 99. Doug Waite, 99 to 2001. Jason Smith, 2001 to 2007, which, yeah, makes him the longest tenured team captain for Edmonton in the NHL. Uh, Ethan Morrow, 2007 to 2010. Sean Horkoff, 2010 to 2013. Uh, Andrew Ferentz, 2013 to 2015. And Connor McDavid, 2016 until present. 2019. Uh, Ryan Smith was uh, honorary captain in 2014 for his final game in the National Hockey League. So he's not listed, but he was captain for his final game in 2014, which is a nice gesture by the uh, Edmonton Oilers. Smith, really, I'm, I'm surprised he wasn't on the captain's list, but you're always surprised when you look back at histories at who's not captain necessarily. Top 10 draft picks. This is lengthy. Uh, 1980, drafting 6th, they draft Paul Coffey, Hall of Fame. Uh, 1981, they draft 8th, they get Grant Fuhr, also in the Hall of Fame. So they've got two Hall of Famers in the top 10 drafts in 80 and 81, and then they don't draft in the top 10 again until 1993. When Jason Arnott's drafted at 7, 1994, drafting 4th, Jason Bond Sr., and drafting 6th, uh, Ryan Smith. And of course, Bond Sr. never becomes a solid top NHLer. Uh, 1995 drafting sixth, Steve Kelly. Same. Uh, 1996 drafting sixth, Boyd Devereaux. There's a pattern here. And then drafting sixth again in 2007, so 11 years later, they get Sam Gagne. They draft sixth for three years in a row in the 90s, so read into that what you will. Uh, 2009 they draft 10th, Magnus Pajarvi. Uh, 2010, they draft first, Taylor Hall, and they enjoy being first at the draft table so much, they do it two more times in a row. Ryan Nugent Hopkins in 2011, and Nail Yakupov in 2012. 2013, drafting seventh, Darnell Nurse. 2014, drafting third, Leon Dreisaitl. They win the draft lottery in 2015, and they get Connor McDavid at number one. Number four in 2016, they get Jesse Pugliarvi, which I looked at at the time and said, wow, what a steal by... By Edmonton, why was Dubois drafted ahead of Pugliarvi? And now we all know. Uh, 2018, they draft 10th, Evan Bouchard, and the draft we just had in 2019, Philip Broberg is drafted at 8th. A lot of top 10 draft picks, especially when you're looking from 2007 until now. There's a ton. Not much until then, but it's a lot. And four, count them, four number one draft picks from 2010 until now. And this is why when people say, hey, if the Oilers win this draft lottery, I'm losing it. This is why people say it. So, that being said, it's all nice and tidy over here. You know, you've got a team that struggles. And you've got all of these legends over here from the 80s. And things are pretty good. But how did you get from the 80s and the legends to just mediocre from then on? Trading. Poor trading decisions. So, while Chiarelli gets, like I said, a lot of, a lot of blame over recent years... It's not like they were making fantastic trades until then either. All right, so without any further ado, and because this is going to be the meat and potatoes of this, this video, let us discuss the draft history of the team 
that wasn't sold by Peter Pocklington until 1998. He had financial problems and they affected the team because of his financial problems. And just to, he was cheap. He was cheap. He didn't want to pay these guys. He loved having these guys on the team, but he wanted them to stick around on budget deals that nobody was signing on a level that nobody in their right mind would sign. So June 9th, 1979, as they come into the National Hockey League, they get a fourth round draft pick from Minnesota in order for Minnesota not to lose Paul Schmier. Fourth round draft pick's not a big deal. And the Oilers get Glenn Anderson. That's a Hall of Famer added right there. Uh, August 9th of 1979, uh, the Edmonton Oilers get Dave Semenko in a 1979 third round draft pick. Minnesota gets a second round draft pick in 1979, which is Neil Broughton and then Kevin Maxwell in the third round. And um, the third round draft pick Edmonton gets is Messier. So you've added Messier, Semenko, and Anderson already, and the team hasn't hit the ice yet. August 22nd, 1999, Edmonton gets a, a 1981 sixth round draft pick and toronto gets reg thomas and if you're asking who that's fine it was a sixth round draft pick which became steve smith so there's another piece of the dynasty roster of the edmonton oilers added so they're doing really really well with trades uh august 19th 1982 they had ken lensman and don knockbauer hartford gets risto siltonen risto siltonen i know how to say it brent loney and uh, Ken Lindsman is, uh, he, he's a catalyst for the Oilers, and yet he's a problem for the Oilers in the locker room as well. So, um, it, June 21st of 1984, after that first Stanley Cup, the Oilers add Mike Crucial Niski, and Boston adds Ken Lindsman. So, Lindsman, you're going to Boston. Uh, so, this, this I'm going to go ahead and still say it's a win for Edmonton, because they get Lindsman, he's a problem. And they go, all right, well, you know, we're, we're we're doing well. All right, we won the Stanley Cup. That's great. But Lindsman's not going to be in this locker room in the fall. We'll move him out, and they get Christian Liske back, who's a pretty solid addition from Boston. September 10th, 1985, Edmonton gets uh, Tim Hrinowicz, Marty McSorley, and Craig Muni from Pittsburgh for Joel Malosh. And this was a trade where they add McSorley to get some toughness, but Muni ends up becoming a steal in that deal. And so it's a trade that Pittsburgh, uh, if you can do it over again, you don't make that trade because that's two blue liners off of a Pittsburgh team that really needs depth on the blue line. So it's definitely a mistake in hindsight. November 24th, 1987. This is where it starts. This is where you start to see some cracks forming. Paul Coffey's the first one to come out and say, hey, uh, I want to get paid. The problem is Paul Coffey has kind of a prickly personality. So it comes across as ego to some, and it's easy to kind of write it off like, ah, he thinks he's bigger than the team. I don't know. So he gets traded to Pittsburgh. What Edmonton gets back is Dave Hannon, Chris Joseph, Mo Mantha, and Craig Simpson. And Simpson has a pretty good run with the Oilers. But Pittsburgh gets Paul Coffey, Dave Hunter, and Wayne Van Dorp. And, of course, we know Pittsburgh wins a couple of Stanley Cups in part because they have Coffey on the blue line. March 8th, 1988, the Boston Bruins acquire Andy Moog, who had been sitting out because he wanted better treatment than the Oilers were giving him. The Oilers get back Jeff Cortnell, Bill Ranford, and a 1988 second-round pick that became Martin Rusinski. So the Oilers win that trade going away. Uh, I loved Moog in Boston. Great two Stanley Cup runs. Uh, he had a bigger part in the 91 than in 88 when Lemelin was, was, was the guy. But... Uh, I'm still going to go ahead and say that's a trade that goes Edmonton's way, though they, they do, again, shed a player from this dynasty that they've been putting together. August 9th, 1988, the big day when the tear, teardown really officially becomes uh, massive. And you can ask whether Gretzky wanted out or whether he was pushed. Uh, did Janet Jones get in his ear and she wanted to go to California? By all accounts, no. That was a narrative that was out there that Janet Jones was the reason. But by all accounts, when you look back now, no. Gretzky would have been fine staying in Edmonton, but Pocklington loved money. And so the Oilers acquired Jimmy Carson, Marty Jelena, a 1989 first, a 1991 first, a 1993 first. Oh, that first in 91 became Rosinski. That's why we've got Rosinski on the board. That's right. Uh, and then cash. A lot of cash. 
Uh, the LA Kings get Wayne Gretzky, Mike Krushelniski, and uh, Marty McSorley. So a couple of those wins that they got where they get Krushelniski and you get uh, McSorley, now that's a loss because they go with Gretzky. Like, who in their right mind, which GM sits down and goes, okay, we're going to give you 99. Arguably, and I say arguably because it's always an argument, the greatest player in National Hockey League history. Give me back Jimmy Carson, Marty Jelena, and three first-round draft picks, which likely won't be very early in the draft because we're giving you Gretzky. And uh, throw us some money. And then he goes, ah, you're going to have to sweeten the deal a little bit. So you have to throw in Krushelniski and, and McSorley. Wow. Like, that's... That's that's some some serious cojones going on there. That's that's insane. That's just absolute insanity, and that's kind of how things are done with the the Edmonton Oilers. Oh, uh, so coming out of that ugliness, uh, November second, nineteen eighty nine, the Oilers add Adam Graves, Peter Klima, Joe Murphy, and Jeff Sharples from the Detroit Red Wings for uh, Jimmy Carson. So Carson lasts a year in Edmonton and then decides I want out. Uh, Kevin McClelland and a 1991 fifth round pick. So Carson moves on already, but the Oilers did well. They get the kid line that plays a huge role in them winning a Stanley Cup in 1990. So I'm going to go ahead and say that's a win. And Carson never quite gets to, he never quite lives up to his, his advanced billing and, and his rookie season. Um, you can see some, some holes in his game pretty early on. Uh, May 30th, 1991. Yeah, do you want to tear down? Because here comes some more. Uh, Philadelphia makes a trade with the Oilers. The Oilers acquire Scott Mellenby, Craig Fisher, and Craig Berube. Uh, Philadelphia acquires Corey Foster, Dave Brown, and Yerry Curry. Now, Curry ends up going to Italy for a year. But the fact that they're trading Yerry Curry, who's like, can I get some money? No. Uh, Curry's going to end up in the, with the Kings. But, again, here's your number two scorer all time. And you're kind of going, oh, you want money? No. And so he ends up going to Philadelphia. And even though Mellonby, Fisher, and Berube isn't a bad return, just the fact that you're, you've got Curry in there, uh, that's that's just not good enough. September 19th, 1991. They add Vinny Domfus and Peter Ng. They also add Luke Richardson, Scott Thornton, and Cash. There's Cash again. Notice there's money that's going to the Oilers. And there was always talk that Pocklington took the cash that he got in these trades and, and threw it into his other struggling businesses. Um, so what Toronto gets is Glenn Anderson, Craig Berube, Grant Fuhr, and are you serious? Fuhr and Anderson, two future Hall of Famers, and they get back, and Don Foos was good. He's a good player, I'm not going to lie. But the rest of it, I mean, Fuhr for Ng? No. So the Oilers, again, there's an overall downgrade of the roster we see going on here. Uh, October 4th of 1991, so less than a month after that. Less than a month after saying goodbye to Glenn Anderson and Grant Fuhr, it's Messier's turn. So the Oilers acquire Louis DeBrusque, Bernie Nichols, Stephen Rice, and David Shaw. The Rangers acquire Mark Messier and Jeff Bukaboom. Again. Again. We're offering you Messier. We want back DeBrusque, Nichols, Stephen Rice, and David Shaw. And they go, eh, throw in Bukaboom and we got a deal. And the Oilers go, okay, yeah, good physical defenseman? Yeah, all right, sure, we'll throw in Jeff Bukaboom. So there's there's what happens right there. You lose Curry, Anderson, Fuhr, and Messier between May and October of 91. That is, in essence, how the Oilers go from contending, maybe, to... Not, and they're done. That's it. They're done. Um, August 27th, 1992. They had Shane Corson, Brent Gilchrist, and Vladimir Wojtek. Montreal gets Vinny Domfus and a 1993 fourth-round pick. Uh, again, I'm leaning towards Montreal for getting the best player on that trade. Uh, December 11th, 1992, the Oilers get Roman Oxuda and a 1993 third in exchange for Kevin Lowe going to the Rangers. That is a large win for the Rangers. Um, 
Roman Oxuda was a guy that when he, he played in Vancouver, I, I yelled at my TV quite a bit. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give that as a win. Oxuda at the time was considered a pretty decent prospect, but Kevin Lowe, anyways, I know Lowe was getting older, and but it's how you treat your veterans, and, and they weren't treating them well, and everybody was just leaving. Um, January 13th, 1993, the Oilers acquires Zdeno Seeger and Kevin Todd, New Jersey, gets Bernie Nichols. So Nichols, who they had acquired two years earlier as part of a package for Messier, has already played his way out of town, and you have Seeger and Todd to replace him. Okay, so if you if you follow the chart of, of how, what they turned their, their Hall of Fame roster into, it's, it's sad. I don't recommend it at all. Um, March 17th, 1993, they make a good trade with the Rangers. They add Doug Waite. The Rangers take Tikkanen, and I remember thinking at the time, okay, I like Tikkanen, but seriously? So the idea with that was they were trying to put together the Oilers. This is why when Ranger fans get a little ticked that the 94 team were called Edmonton East, and I mentioned that they were called Edmonton East. There's a reason. It happens again in 94 as well. March 21st, 1994, so again at the deadline, Todd Marchant is added to the Edmonton Oilers in exchange for Craig McTavish going to the Rangers. Again, Marchant is a good young forward. McTavish, his best days are behind him, but he's, he's again, he's going to Messier and, and the Rangers. Messier's putting the old group back together, and they're going to go on a Stanley Cup run. Um, August 4th, 1995, the Oilers add Curtis Joseph and Mike Greer from St. Louis for a first-round draft pick, both in 96, which becomes Marty Reasoner, and a draft pick first-rounder first in 1997. Um, I'm going to give that as a win to the Oilers. Cujo was fantastic. I never understood why Cujo didn't spend his whole career in St. Louis, to be honest. I I didn't. Uh, he had a good career in numerous cities, but I, I really thought he should have been a blue. Um, January 4th, 1980, 1998. Sorry, Edmonton gets Bill Guerin and Valeri Zelopukin. And New Jersey gets Jason Arnott and Brian Muir. This is a tough one. Because Guerin... Pretty damn good player. Arnett got better as he got older. Um, they would regret this long term, but in the short term, it was pretty good. March 20th, 1999, the Oilers acquire Tommy Sallow. The Islanders get Mats Lindgren and a 1998 eighth round draft pick. That's right. The draft used to go a lot longer than it does now. Um, this is a win for the Oilers. Tommy Sallow, who was on the outs with the Islanders, and Sallow gave them decent enough goaltending through... A, a rebuilding stage that they're eventually coming out of. Eventually. Um, November 10th, 2000, the Oilers acquire Anson Carter, a 2001 second, a 2001 first round draft pick, which became Hemsky, and the Boston Bruins get Bill Guerin and a 2001 first. So Boston picks up Guerin. Uh, it's, a, it's not that lopsided a deal, though. Carter's pretty good in Edmonton, and... Uh, Hemsky, of course, had a, a decent long run with them, so I'm not going to give him the loss there. I don't want to pick on him too much. Uh, that's still to come. August 2, uh, or August 2nd, I guess, 2005, the Oilers get Chris Pronger, St. Louis gets Eric Brewer, Doug Lynch, and Jeff Witka. That is a steal for the Oilers. So, Pronger comes to Edmonton, and everything's just great. The Oilers go to the Stanley Cup Final in 2006, and then... Pronger's wife doesn't want to live in Edmonton. Or Pronger wants out of Edmonton. And at the time, it's, well, which is the truth? Does Pronger want out or does his wife want him to get out? Either way, he ends up being traded. So this is where the shoehorn comes in. July 3rd, 2006. So he's officially an oiler for less than a year. Uh, the Oilers get Joffrey Lupel, Ladislav Schmid, a 2007 first, a 2008 second, which became Travis Hamannick. A first-round draft pick in 2008, which became Jordan Eberle. Anaheim gets Chris Pronger. So, Hall of Famer out the door. And what they got back, you know, I, I like Eberle and all, but they eventually turn Eberle into the lesser as well. So, uh, that was that was a, a trade they had to make. They, they Their backs were against the wall. The, the Ducks knew it. And the Ducks win a Stanley Cup in part because they had Chris Pronger. And it's not in small part either. It's large part. Um, so losing Pronger was really a gut punch for Oilers fans and for the team. Uh, February 27th, 2007. 
another gut punch shows up. Uh, had to include this. Edmonton gets Robert Nelson, Ryan O'Mara, and a 2007 first-round pick, which became Alex Plant. And the Islanders get Ryan Smith. I mean, it's a rental. So, for a rental, but still, Ryan Smith, he's he's Mr. Euler. He's he's the guy. He's he's their face of the franchise. And when he got traded, of course, he, he cried at the press conference after he was traded, famously. And it was it was not a good look for the Oilers that a team that, that looked like maybe they were starting to get it together in 2006. Maybe they were building to something. They go to the finals. They have Pronger on the blue line. Things look pretty good. And then Pronger's gone that summer. And by the time the next summer rolls around, Ryan Smith's gone as well. It just, it, it, it took the team that was building itself up and cut them off, cut them off at the knees again. Uh, now we're back onto the board, away from the ones that are shoehorned in. February 28th, 2011, Edmonton acquires Colton Tubert and a 2011 first, which became Oscar Clefbaum, in return for L.A. getting Dustin Penner. Dustin Penner, they poached from the Ducks as a restricted free agent. They offer sheeted him. Uh, Brian Burke offered to punch Kevin Lowe in the face, uh, to which Lowe didn't really respond um and it was it was a, a a disastrous signing for the most part they they gave up um assets to the to the ducks that i don't think they would have to give up and trade for penner at that point and uh it's it's another misstep there's the thomas vanek uh offer sheet as well which buffalo matches and it just it just raises the price for vanek and it just shows the desperation in edmonton to try to give their fans Hope at this stage. Um, January 15th, 2014, the Oilers acquire Matt Hendricks um, and the Nashville Predators get Devin Dubnik. And if you don't remember Dubnik playing for the Predators, I don't blame you. He bounced around a bit uh, and then he he came back to life. Arizona figured it out and they got him going and then they move him over to Minnesota and the rest is history. Uh, the thing with Dubnik, I don't know that he ever would have recovered if he'd stayed in Edmonton. His... His play had deteriorated pretty badly. And I don't know if it was goaltending coaches in Edmonton that just couldn't figure it out or if it was something with Dubnik himself and he needed to bounce around a bit to get himself back together. Um, but it's it's an unfortunate deal that all they got was Matt Hendricks for Dubnik. You look at Dubnik now with Minnesota. He would he would get a little more of a return than that. Uh, January, nope, June. June 26, 2015. The Oilers acquired Griffin Reinhardt. What in the world? What in the world is Edmonton thinking on this one? Uh, because they, they, they give up a first-round pick in 2015, which became Barzell, and a second. They acquired Griffin Reinhardt and gave up a draft pick, which became Matthew Barzell. How amazing would the, Island, would, would the Oilers look right now with Barzell in their lineup? If you had Barzell in the middle, you can leave Drysaitel on the wing. You don't need to worry about it because Barzell's your second line center, Nugent Hopkins is your third line center, and you've got offense. Lots of offense. It's uh, it's it's one of the worst trades in National Hockey League history, and I think as time goes by, it'll only look worse. Uh, but moving along, February twenty seventh, twenty sixteen, the Oilers acquire a twenty sixteen third round pick in exchange for Pittsburgh getting Justin Schultz, and of course. Because the Oilers have traded him, Schultz gets better for Pittsburgh. How good Justin Schultz is depends on who you ask. I think he's a pretty damn solid defenseman myself. Uh, he had a tough season this past year, but he's still probably better than a third-round pick in return in a trade. Um, June 29th, 2016, the Oilers acquired Adam Larson for, for this guy. This, of course, is my Taylor Hall jersey. I don't wear it very often. I figured I could for this video. Um, Hall's trade... It showed a lack of patience, and it was it was an attempt by Peter Chiarelli, and I get why the attempt was there, to change the culture of losing. This was not just about, you know, trading out a top six winger. It was the idea that uh, the Oilers, it, he, that there was a feeling they were they were okay with losing. It didn't bother them, um, and, and that culture needed to change in Edmonton, and that's what Chiarelli was reportedly trying to do. And that Hall was, and again, I'm saying reportedly, I'm not saying I know from insider information. The reports were that that he was one of those guys who kind of had to go if they were going to shed that that losing reputation. Uh, 
June 26th, or June 22nd, 2017, they acquire Ryan Strom from the Islanders for Jordan Everly. At the time this takes place, there are Oilers fans who say this makes sense. Everly is costing us too much money. Strom's fine. Strom's a cheaper option. And all I could think was, he's also a less talented option. That's a problem right there. If you're trading to try to save money, but you're getting less talented, you should probably rethink who you're trading and why. But Everly goes to the Islanders, and of course he turns it on with the Islanders, because that's what happens when you leave Edmonton. you got to make them look bad. Uh, June 29th, 2016. Nope. November 16th, 2018. Uh, the Oilers acquire Ryan Spooner for Ryan Strom. So Everly to Strom and now Spooner. And Spooner, who had a really solid run for the Rangers after the trade deadline the previous season, well, by the time the season we just finished has rolled around, we know Spooner's not really NHL level. February 16th, 2019, to try to make up for this, they acquire Sam Gagne from Vancouver in exchange for Ryan Spooner, which Gagne's numbers with Edmonton upon his return were decent to start with, and then it ended up kind of, it's, it's a middling number. I think he had five goals after his return from Edmonton in 30-some games. But Gagne being an upgrade over Spooner, I will give you that. But again, it started with Everly. So they definitely traded down. And then uh, the trade that just occurred a couple of days ago, they acquired James Neal in exchange for Milan Lucic and a conditional 2020 third round pick. And the conditions have come out. The conditions are this. Uh, if Neal scores 21 or more goals and Milan Lucic scores 10 or less, then that's a conditional. No, if he scores, if he scores less than 11. That's right. If he scores 10, it's fine. But if he scores... Uh, no, if he scores 10, it's not fine. If it's, if it's 10 or less, yeah, that's right. Anyways, yeah, I got it. <laughs> if Neil scores 21 and you see Lucic with 10 by the end of the year, then that third round pick goes to Kyogre. Uh, the, the, the Flames hoping that, that Lucic plays better for them than he did for Edmonton and the Oilers betting on Neil being that top six winger that they've desperately needed to play, uh, on a wing with, um, with McDavid, or potentially with Dreisaitl, should they have him playing in the middle this coming season rather than throwing him on the wing on regular occasions. It is it is a, an, an interesting time. It is always an interesting time with the Oilers. Uh, it was very interesting in the 80s for all the winning, and then they sort of trade all the winning away in the early 90s, and since then it's just been... It's been quite the ride. And uh, it... it do they get out of this mess? Do they stop drafting in the top 10? Is this the year they stop drafting in the top 10? Because the moves they've made in the offseason, while Neil's an improvement, I I'm still not sold on this roster necessarily getting out of the top 10 in the draft. 2007, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019. T 2017, they're not drafting in the top 10. We'll see. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. And hey, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for all your support. I'll talk to you again soon.